Great. I'm here with uh, Minister of Finance Travis Taze, Minister of Infrastructure Prasad Pandey, and Minister uh, for, Transport, uh, for Transportation Rick McIver for an important announcement about our effort to get Albertans back to work during these trying economic times. As you know, our number one focus is on the public health of Albertans during this pandemic. At the same time, as I said on Tuesday, we must maintain a serious focus on the enormous economic adver adversity that Albertans are facing. Between the uh, global coronavirus recession, which has led to a shutdown of many parts of the Alberta economy, and the unprecedented collapse in energy prices, we are facing a time of economic adversity that we have not experienced since the 1930s. That started to become evident uh, in today's uh, Stats Can report on employment, which showed a decline of 117,000 jobs in Alberta last month and over a million jobs across Canada. But we need to understand this is just the beginning. The Stats Can numbers would only have picked up uh, uh, the, uh, the beginning of the downturn and the shutdown as a result of the coronavirus at the end of March. And uh, I anticipate uh, much more challenging figures uh, at, at the end of April and as we move into the spring. Uh, as I said to Albertans on Tuesday, we expect to see a global economic recovery following the peak of the pandemic this summer. But because of the huge collapse in energy prices, uh, I anticipate that Alberta's recovery uh, will uh, take longer and the downturn will be deeper. Uh, that is why our government is focused on our immediate action to save jobs, to create jobs, but also our mid and long-term plan for economic recovery. Part of that involves the relaunch strategy I outlined for Albertans this week so that we can begin to reopen businesses and get people back to work by relaxing social distancing public health orders as quickly as possible while protecting Albertans from a potential second wave of the coronavirus pandemic. At the same time, we have created the Economic Recovery Council made up of some of the Alberta's brightest minds to inform our efforts at economic diversification and economic recovery. Uh, many of those measures will uh, be implemented uh, following the peak of the pandemic, because right now our economy is still in a, a serious contraction mode. So it wouldn't make sense for us to blow all of our fiscal power to use up all of our resources uh, right now when the economy is in contraction. But there are measures that we can take now, that we must take now, and one of those we're announcing today, a uh, $2 billion investment uh, in job creation through accelerated maintenance and renewal of provincial infrastructure. I'm very pleased to announce this huge surge in sp uh, spending that will uh, increase our ability to create thousands of good paying jobs. We're doubling the capital maintenance and renewal funding in this fiscal year by accelerating the capital plan to resurface roads, repair bridges, restore schools, and fill potholes. This will allow us to act quickly and work with companies across the province so they can keep their workers employed during these tough times. Let me give you a few examples of the jobs that need doing and will be created as a result of this emergency surge of a billion dollars. Uh, schools in our K-12 system will get needed repairs to windows, doors, uh, and, uh, and roofs. Similarly, we'll have HVAC updates and other mechanical retrofits in post-secondary facilities to bring them up to efficiency standards. We're also updating the information technology and audiovisual equipment used by enforcement personnel and courtroom staff. We'll be working on our roads and bridge decks as well, so they'll be ready when businesses reopen uh, later this spring and need supplies and products delivered quickly. And great news for all the, those uh, drivers on our provincial highways who we support so much, bringing critical supplies to us. Well, crews will be out making uh, sure our, that our roads are pothole free. And you got the marching orders on that, Minister McIver. I believe that now is the perfect time to take action on these projects. Albertans need work today more than ever. Uh, 
This is in addition to the $12 billion of fiscal action already taken as part of Alberta's response to the COVID-19 crisis. $12 billion of unprecedented support for both uh, households, individuals, and job creators. Uh, for example, this includes the um, emergency isolation payments in which we have ended up uh, con uh, paying out over $100 million, twice as much as originally budgeted. It includes billions of dollars in loan deferrals and access to credit uh, through Alberta Treasury branches, which of course is owned by the people of Alberta. Uh, it includes uh, hundreds of millions of dollars in deferrals in taxes uh, for employers uh, and a reduction in the uh, non-residential property tax rate, it includes a deferral of workers' compensation board premiums and the government assuming the cost of half of those uh, for the small businesses this year. It includes a deferral on Alberta student loan payments uh, and are the government assuming the cost of interest on that $150 million in relief for Alberta uh, students and young people. It involves, of course, our half billion dollar uh, additional investment in health care uh, to give our nurses, doctors, and health administrators the resources they need uh, to limit the spread and provide the best possible care. Uh, it includes um, a number of other actions that collectively add up to uh, today now uh, $13 billion in fiscal action taken by the government of Alberta. We appreciate the other measures announced by the government of Canada uh, and urge the federal government to accelerate delivery of the emergency employment insurance benefits uh, for people who have been laid off or are in isolation because of the pandemic. I, in particular, I once again commend the federal government for the 75% uh, wage subsidy for small and medium-sized businesses and encourage them to get that in place and those payments out the door as quick as possible uh, to, to keep those jobs in place. Um, but most importantly, we once again urge the Government of Canada to move forward with uh, urgent efforts uh, to uh, protect Canada's largest industry, our oil and gas sector, which is responsible for 800,000 jobs in Canada directly and indirectly, our largest export uh, sector. Uh, Minister Taze and I have been working with our counterparts in Ottawa on a daily basis for the past three weeks, giving them all necessary information and in daily communication with our oil and gas sector, upstream producers, uh, the service sector and, and other companies. Uh, to identify the most efficient way of ensuring that during these very trying times, they will have a future. As I've said before, we will not allow the foreign funded special interests or the Russians and Saudis to permanently damage our energy industry. That's why I've spent uh, several hours this morning on the phone with members of the U United States Senate and House of Representatives seeking coordinated North American action to defend our energy industry. Uh, it's also why earlier this week I spoke to American Secretary of Energy Dan Briette. We had a very positive 40-minute conversation about the need for coordinated action to defend North America's energy industry uh, from predatory dumping uh, by foreign powers. And it's also why uh, our Energy Minister, Sonia Savage, today is participating in the OPEC Plus uh, teleconference about the urgent need uh, to bring uh, sanity back to global uh, oil and gas markets. So we will continue uh, to act on all of these fronts, but today is an important practical uh, demonstration of uh, rapid action by the government of Alberta to create jobs when they are so desperately needed. Uh, let me just add one last note. Some people may ask, is it, why, are any, why is anybody going to work at this point? Well, the government of Alberta is scrupulously following the public health orders that we have put in place upon the advice of our chief medical officer. Uh, and, and part of that has been the definition of what constitute essential services. One of those essential services is construction. Construction season is upon us. We cannot afford to lose a day when we need this money spent in the economy now. 
And uh, all of these uh, jobs will be done in full compliance with the public health orders and with the uh, uh, sanitation guidelines. So we'll, of course, work with all of our contractors to remind them of how to do that safely, uh, work with them to ensure they have, where necessary, relevant personal protective equipment uh, to ensure that their workers stay safe. The other day, I spoke to some Albertans who say that we should just let the virus run its course and uh, reopen the economy right now. I pointed out that would just in, uh, let the virus loose and force us to a situation where we would have to uh, shut down the economy even more rigidly in the future, creating even more damage to jobs and livelihoods. That's, the, that's a wrong approach. It, I also hear from people saying, shut everything down now. Well, the, the cost to uh, public health and well-being of nobody working, of nothing getting done, uh, would be incalculable as well. Instead, what we are doing is following the uh, evidence-based advice of our public health experts uh, taking a sensible and prudent approach. And part of that approach is getting people back to work right now, this spring, with this uh, additional uh, billion dollars, this doubling of Alberta's budget this year uh, for uh, capital uh, maintenance and renewal. With that, I'm happy to invite uh, Minister Prasad Panda uh, to provide details. Thank you, Premier. Good morning. Folks, uh, the Premier has said we must be honest with Albertans. The truth is perhaps no other jurisdiction in the world faces a more difficult road to recovery from the coronavirus and the economic situation it has created. Today, we are accelerating spending on capital maintenance and renewal. We will spend more money replacing boilers, replacing roofs, and fixing leaky pipes and windows. We are spending more money on these projects because it will extend the life and value of the public infrastructure and because it will create jobs for people in the short term when we face unemployment, unlike Alberta has seen in, uh, in the last 90 years. One month ago, I joined Premier to announce Alberta's capital plan of $19.3 billion over the next three years. That was one day after Alberta saw its first case of coronavirus. Since then, the world has changed. We face an acute shortage of work. Albertans need jobs. Accelerating the capital maintenance and renewal budget is one tool we have to create jobs. While everyone on this stage believes in capitalism, free markets, and a limited role for government in the economy, we will not allow Albertans to lose their livelihoods, and we will do everything in our power to keep this economic situation from further deterioration. As Alberta's Minister of Infrastructure, I have been clear with my officials since this uh, crisis hit. Let's get the red tape, let, let's cut the red tape and get the money out the door. We haven't done our job until the workers are on site working safely. Today's announcement is an addition to the new schools, courthouses, and medical facilities we announced in the capital plan. It's also in addition to the investing in Canada infrastructure program, which the federal government uh, administers. So we, when we invited intake for uh, ICIP uh, program applications, we received more than 700 applications from stakeholders but we could only end our 75 of those projects because of the limited money we have uh, from federal government. So I'm working every day to get that previously approved ICIP money flowing. And at the same time, I'm working with Federal Minister of Infrastructure, Catherine McKenna, to find new federal money for this province that has given our country so much. My family, like so many others, chose this province because of its limitless potential. While the days and weeks ahead will be filled with uncertainty, this government stands with its people and will do everything to keep Albertans working. I would not be here if I don't believe that Alberta's best days still lie ahead. 
While the short term may pose many obstacles in our path, we'll emerge united and stronger than ever before. Thank you and God bless. With that, I'll ask my colleague, uh, Minister of Infrastructure, uh, Minister of Transportation, Minister McIver, to come and uh, give his uh, comments. <clears throat> Thanks, Premier. Thanks, Minister Panda. Good morning, everybody. It's, uh, it's my pleasure to be here. This is an important day because Alberta has a vast provincial highway network that includes 31,000 kilometers or 63,800 lane kilometers of highways and almost 4,500 bridge structures, including bridges, overpasses, and large culverts. My transportation department works hard to ensure our thousands of kilometers of highway are safe for Albertans to travel. A well-maintained network means that goods and services and people move more quickly and effectively throughout the province. It protects and creates hundreds of jobs in communities across Alberta. Those jobs are more important now than ever before. Alberta's enormous network needs timely maintenance to prevent larger and more expensive repair bills down the road. As the Premier outlined, the capital maintenance and renewal for 2021 is being doubled. That represents a $350 million accelerated investment. This year will support projects to maintain and improve the condition of Alberta's highway network. This significant investment in Alberta's roads and bridges is part of our plan to keep Alberta's working during the COVID-19 pandemic. We are starting with capital maintenance and renewal because we can move dollars into projects and jobs right away. And because it ensures our roads and bridges last longer, we'll get more value in the long run for the taxpayers paying the bill. We will use the money to fund major maintenance activities like paving of roads and rehabilitation and replacement of bridges that extend the life of Alberta's vast highway network. We will move forward on asphalt overlay projects on key highways, including our primary trade corridors that serve our energy and key sectors to support industry and to help get Alberta goods to market now and during the recovery. The stimulus investment will allow us to replace the Highway 2 Peace River Bridge Deck, pave 21 kilometres of Highway 9 west of Richdale to east of Youngstown, then pave 35 kilometres of Highway 43 between Fox Creek and Valley View, just to name a few examples. Now I want to speak briefly about one of my favourite subjects, potholes. I've heard a lot about potholes this winter from Alberta, Albertans. They tend to call and, uh, and they've made and how they've made many sections of highways throughout Alberta difficult to drive on. Our major roads like Highway 16, Highway 2 and Highway 1 certainly come to mind. I'm glad to say that an additional 60 million dollars will go towards hot pothole repairs this year across the province. 60 million dollars will repair a lot of potholes but it will do a lot more. The funding will help us proceed with highway maintenance and preservation work that will make our highways safer to drive on and last longer. This involves a wide range of work, pothole patching, spray patching, line pay, pay, painting and other technologies that will improve thousands of kilometres of highways this year. We'll also proceed with other work that will improve highway safety, including installing uh, new cable barriers and guardrails, mowing tall weeds, grading gravel roads, marking crosswalk, crosswalks and other markings on the pavement. We're facing un unprecedented times. I know many Albertans are struggling, people are asked, being asked to stay home or have lost their jobs and they are concerned about providing for their families. That's why we're focusing on capital maintenance and renewal projects because these projects can begin right away. This, this approach gets the money out the door into Albertans pockets through their jobs and into the economy creating even more jobs. It will have an immediate effect on the economic recovery and we expect these projects themselves to create thousands of jobs throughout Alberta. Now is the perfect time to take action on these projects. Albertans need the work now. Working on our roads and bridge decks will have them ready when businesses reopen and need supplies and products delivered quickly. By investing in capital maintenance and renewal projects, we will be able to make necessary improvements to our highways and bridges, keep our co companies running and provide jobs for Albertans. I'm very pleased that our department will play such a big part in keeping Albert Albertans, Albertans moving and rebuilding our province. Thank you for your time today.
All right, we'll start the Q&A. Uh, we'll start on the phone. Operator, can you put through the first caller, please? Oh, one, one moment. Before the first question, just I wanted to add one thing, which is this is not the end of uh, the additional investments we'll be making to create jobs through a surge in capital spending and infrastructure spending to build things in this province, but it's a key part of it. We were already at a historic high level of spending on infrastructure, 6.9 billion this year, as Prasad said, uh, over 18 billion over the next three years. This acceleration is uh, one initial part of our economic uh, recovery package, uh, but there will be many more initiatives to follow in the weeks and months to come, strategically timed to maximize the benefit in terms of job creation. Great, all right, operator, can you put through the first caller, please? Our first question comes from Chris Barco of the Calgary Herald, your line is open. Hi, Premier. There's multiple reports uh, this morning of a news of a deal uh, between OPEC and non-OPEC nations to cut production by at least 10 million barrels a day. Just wondering about your reaction to this news, and also has the province agreed to further production cuts as part of it? I cannot yet confirm that agreement uh, on the part of OPEC. I, this is not yet a formal uh, declaration. There have been a lot of reports about an agreement primarily between the Saudis and Russians uh, that would see each of them cut uh, output to about 8 million uh, barrels per day. For the Russians, that would be a, a roughly a 1.5 million uh, barrel per day reduction in output. And for the Saudis, based on a February benchmark, it would see them going from roughly, uh, I think, 12.4 to 8 million uh, barrels per day. Uh, in, that, uh, in that range, of course, we would hope to see uh, uh, other uh, production cuts by other OPEC producers. I certainly hope that is true uh, because uh, what they have been doing by surging supply in the face of unprecedented collapse in demand has been to create a uh, crisis not just in Canada but across the entire global energy uh, sector. And it is totally unsustainable. So we absolutely hope that this is the case. We've been, uh, on Sunday, Minister Savage uh, spoke for over half an hour uh, to the Secretary General of OPEC uh, and conveyed a very clear message, as did I with United States Secretary of Energy Briette uh, when we spoke uh, on uh, Monday night of this week uh, for about 40 hours, 40, excuse me, it feels like 40 hours, but 40 minutes. Um, we have not been asked uh, to uh, constrain Alberta energy output. I, we have made it clear to uh, OPEC and to the United States that we already are curtailed as a result of the, the decision made in January of last year. And uh, we are further constrained by the scarcity of pipeline capacity. So we've made it, you know, I think the, the main concern in OPEC plus is that North American producers not surge production to occupy the space created by their own curtailment should they do it. And, and, and I think what we've already seen, according to Secretary Briette, is a uh, reduction of 2 million barrels per day that has been announced by U.S. producers voluntarily shutting in because of the absurdly low prices. And we are seeing estimates of a million barrels per day being taken off here in Canada for the same reasons. You add on to that the uh, hundreds of thousands of barrels that are uh, curtailed through, through the orders of our government, uh, and you're talking about very significant curtailment here, uh, both voluntary and mandatory, that's already happening. So to, uh, uh, to simplify that, um, I desperately hope that this is true. Uh, that uh, they not only come to this agreement today, but that they implement the agreement and, uh, and do so for a long time to come. Because here's the problem, uh, Chris. Uh, uh, as a result of the collapse in demand and the continued high supply, global inventories are, are approaching tank tops. Our current estimate is that every... Uh, square inch of storage in North America will be at tank tops at, in four to six weeks based on current trends. And I don't need to tell you how catastrophic that would be uh, for our industry should that occur. That's the kind of negative price scenario that I, I floated with Albertans on, on Tuesday night. So again, we hope this is true. We're already doing our part through curtailment. 
And um, we hope that this uh, will, will show a path towards recovery for the industry. Okay, we'll go to the floor. Go ahead. Yes, hi, Mirna Jukic for Radio-Canada. Uh, Monsieur le Premier ministre, est-ce que vous pouvez nous dire exactement l'investissement d'aujourd'hui, quels emplois ça va créer et dans, dans combien, de temps, combien de temps ça va prendre avant de faire effet? Sure. So I'll just translate the question and then I'll translate my answer. The question was, could I uh, say how exactly, provide more exact information on today's announcement, how many uh, jobs will it create and when? And uh, I'll essentially say in French much of what I just did in English. Uh, C'est un investissement de 2 milliards de dollars pour le renouvellement de l'infrastructure de la province de l'Alberta pour créer milliers d'emplois. Aujourd'hui, on a vu uh, le, le disparition de uh, plus de 100 000 emplois en Alberta et plus de millions au Canada, mais c'est le début de crise économique, pas la fin. C'est la raison pour laquelle nous agissons aujourd'hui avec, avec un investissement important pour créer les emplois dans le domaine de construction actuellement, dans cette saison de construction, euh, pour, par exemple, renouveler les écoles, les institutions pour secondaire, les autoroutes, euh, pour faire toutes sortes de, 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 euh, des améliorations de l'infrastructure du gouvernement. So I, I basically just said in French what I had said earlier in English about the, uh, the thousands of jobs we expect to create uh, by doubling the budget for a capital renewal and maintenance. And we'll go back to the phones. Operator, can you put through the next caller, please? Our next question comes from James Keller of the Globe and Mail. Your line is open. This is a question for the Premier. Um, yesterday in the legislature, you said the province was not receiving the number of ventilators from the national stockpile it had expected. So can you explain that? How many ventilators were you expecting? What is the shortfall? And uh, more importantly, what happened? Well, uh, I'll just tell you, give me, bear with me a moment. So I have the exact statistics here. The, um, I, I think we had initially received an inv indication that we would be receiving something in the range of 74 ventilators from the national stockpile that is administered by the Public Health a a Agency of Canada. Uh, but uh, the latest indication is that we will receive six instead of 74. Um, I don't have an explanation. You would have to make inquiries with the Public Health Agency of Canada. Um, I, what we have heard, and by the way, I'll be in a conference call later today with all of the premiers and the prime minister, and I will raise this, but our understanding is that uh, the Public Health Agency of Canada's stockpiles were not just for ventilators, but for also for personal protective equipment, uh, much smaller than was originally believed to be the case. And uh, for whatever reason, and I'm not here to point fingers, I don't, I don't think any of us should be involved in political blame games during the crisis. We all need to work together and, and not uh, focus on um, mistakes in the past. But the, my understanding is that uh, PHAC just simply didn't uh, stockpile um, equipment and material in the amounts that would be required uh, to help the country through a, a pandemic of this nature. Uh, fortunately, uh, Alberta Health Services uh, has stockpiled a lot of equipment and uh, people with PPE and uh, ventilators. And they've, uh, they've also been very innovative in, in sourcing additional ventilators. I went through some of this yesterday. We're bringing on stream, uh, we've purchased, um, we, excuse me, we have 35 additional ventilators on order that we are purchasing and we expect them to arrive. Uh, uh, 35 of those have arrived and another 30 will be arriving in May. Uh, we are uh, redirecting 40 ventilators from SAIT and NATE, where they have been there for to support their respiratory therapy programs. Those are now being relocated in hospitals. Uh, I want to thank STARS for having lent AHS uh, six of their ventilators. They still have uh, critical equipment uh, for those, uh, uh, their ambulatory uh, care purposes. Um, we have repurposed 25 uh, rep, um, ventilators uh, from AADL and their respiratory outreach program, and that's basically ventilators that go out to folks who are in home care. Um, and we have repurposed 30 ventilators from chartered surgical facilities. Those are privately operated day surgery 
uh, clinics. And uh, we are uh, taking 305 ventilators through alternative devices capable of mechanical ventilation, including transport, anesthetic, and pediatric devices. Add on to that the six that we have been uh, given by the Public Health Agency of Canada, and that brings us to uh, an incremental uh, 300, I should say, taking us from 314 to 761 ventilators. Okay, Tom, go ahead. Hi, Premier, thanks for taking the question. Uh, in this downturn, there are a lot of conversations out there, people saying maybe this is where we take a big shift, ideas like guaranteed minimum income and stuff like that. Where do you stand on those sorts of ideas and really looking outside of the box of where we've looked before? Well, I do think we have to look outside the box. Everything has changed. The world is completely different, and we don't know how far this is going. So we are keeping an open mind about policy remedies. That was the very first thing I said to our Economic Recovery Council. I said, please don't be limited in your thinking by old responses to different crises. This is a totally new and different time. So we, are, we have to think boldly and imaginatively and act in that spirit. Um, you know, I think we've already been doing that. Even notwithstanding our very serious fiscal constraints, we've already committed $12 billion uh, now today, $13 billion as of this morning, in additional fiscal action uh, to fight for jobs in the economy in this critical time and to provide greater you know, cash in the hands of, of, of both families and households. Um, and, and obviously what we see is, is a lot of, of emergency programs to provide uh, cash support to people in isolation who are now suddenly unemployed and to employers. Uh, I think we need to, first of all, see how that works um, before committing to even new massive programs. Uh, the fiscal action that has been taken by the national government is now in the range of 9% of, of our economy. Fiscal action that we've taken is in the range of 3% of Alberta's economy. You combine those together, we're at now about an 11% of GDP fiscal response to this economic crisis. That's very substantial. I think the numbers will continue to go up in terms of, of, of both federal and provincial response. But I have to remind people, as I said on Tuesday night, that uh, there will be a fiscal reckoning and we can only go so far into additional debt to pay for these things now. Um, there will have to be some difficult choices. We won't be able to do ev everything we want to do or everything that people want. It just won't be possible in this environment. Uh, with, uh, uh, you know, we're, this year I said on Tuesday, we're probably gonna see a roughly a tripling of Alberta's deficit from seven to probably close to $20 billion. And that would imply if, it, it, unless we see a tremendous recovery that we do not now forecast, a huge deficit next year as well. So what I'm trying to say, Tom, is yes, we want to keep an open mind. Uh, we are keeping an open mind. Um, guaranteed annual income, I'm happy for people to have that debate, but at the end of the day, we've got to find a way to pay for it. That's my point. Operator, can you please put through the next caller? The next question comes from Kevin Orland of Bloomberg News. Your line is open. Hello, Premier. Uh, we heard that the uh, U.S., Mexican, and Canadian energy ministers are meeting today. Uh, and I want to see if you knew what was going to be discussed or what has been discussed on that. And also, um, you, you've talked a bit about your, your efforts for uh, speaking about a sort of coordinated action in the North American market. How likely are some of those actions, which measures are, are, are the most likely to occur in your opinion? So could you just, I didn't get the first question. Could you just repeat that? Uh, we hear that the U.S., Mexican, and Canadian energy ministers are meeting today. Right. Uh, do you know what, what was being discussed sure. at, yes. at that meeting? So, uh, yeah, I spoke to U.S. Energy Secretary Briette about that on Monday night, and uh, this is an initial effort to discuss a potential co coordinated North American approach to saving the energy industry. Um, the, uh, we've also been in daily contact with uh, the Federal Minister of Natural Resources, uh, Seamus O'Regan, and I think um, that Alberta and the Canadian government are uh, pretty much on the same page when it comes 
to the need for coordinated North American action. I want to thank uh, Deputy Prime Minister for her, uh, Freeland for uh, her uh, strong understanding about those issues. Um, I've also been work, uh, speaking with uh, Canada's new ambassador to Washington, uh, Kirsten Hillman, about this. Um, and let me just say this, uh, the, the federal governments of at least Canada and the United States, can, can, there are certain things that they can do. And if OPEC plus does not stop the madness, we will be redoubling our push for coordinated import tariffs on OPEC and foreign oil into North America. That's something that our federal governments could do. And I'm getting a very respect, re receptive response on that from both Washington and Ottawa. Uh, in fact, I believe President Trump publicly mused about import tariffs. And uh, so I, we're on the same page as Washington. And I think it's prudent to include Mexico in those conversations as well, because they're not engaged in predatory dumping. And we have to recognize in the NAFTA space a totally integrated energy market. Um, but when it comes to instruments like curtailment, as you know, that's totally at the state and provincial level. And that's one of the reasons that Minister Savage has reached out to members of the Texas Railroad Commission, which is the regulator of their oil and gas sector, uh, to open that conversation. So I think this is a, the conversation uh, between Secretary, Secretary Briette, Minister O'Regan, and their Mexican counterpart is an initial conversation at the, at the national level. But we, we have made it very clear that Alberta needs to be a part of that uh, dialogue in the future. All right. Operator, can you please put through the next caller? The next question comes from Michelle Belfontaine of CBC. Your line is open. Um, hi there, Premier. Thanks for taking my question. Um, I'm sure you're aware that there are concerns right now from the opposition that the Alberta legislature is continuing to sit and uh, debating uh, legislation that's not related to the pandemic, and they're concerned that uh, MLA's uh, health is being put at risk. So what can you tell us about the plans the legislature going forward after today? Sure. Uh People's health is not being put at risk. Uh, the legislature continues to operate uh, under the uh, guidance of the public health officer who uh, gave an exception for the legislature in terms of the uh, limit on gatherings. Uh, we have adopted protocols very carefully to spread out. We have agreed with the opposition not to have more than 50 people in the chamber. People are staggered. They're several feet apart. Uh, we're following enhanced uh, hygiene protocols, uh, doing everything uh, necessary uh, to keep... Uh, uh, the work of democracy happening safely. As I've said before, uh, the work of democracy does not end in a crisis. The uh, British House of Commons met every day during the blitz of the Luftwaffe on L London. Uh, the Luftwaffe actually bombed and destroyed the House of Commons, I believe in 1941, and the House of Commons met in an alternative location the next day. We have... Um, well over, I'm, I'm guesstimating well over 1.1.5 million Albertans who continue to go to work every single day to keep the society functioning. And I don't think it's unreasonable for the people who stock the grocery shelves, who drive the trucks, who operate our farms, who uh, do millions of other important work I don't think it's unreasonable for them to expect that their elective representatives will work too uh, on the people's business. Um, and uh, so that's why I approached the opposition uh, three weeks ago about uh, coming to an understanding on the operation of the legislature. And at that time, the opposition leader said that she thought there was really no problem to be concerned about, that I shouldn't even be really raising the prospect of limited uh, sittings or um, contingency planning. Uh, for coronavirus. Uh, they later came back to us and said, well, they re had rethought that. And so we came to an understanding that the legislature could and should sit on a limited basis following all the public safety or public health protocols. And that's what we've done um, with uh, now, I think, two, three-day sittings, limited sittings, uh, dealing uh, almost exclusively uh, with pandemic-related uh, legislation and uh, also allowing the government to be held to account. I've find the opposition's uh, response to some of this inexplicable. Yesterday, uh, we uh, asked for unanimous consent to allow for myself to present the modeling data from AHS 
on the pandemic and the opposition refused. I can't understand why. Um, legislature uh, sits today. We hope to pass emergency legislation that uh, municipalities asked us to introduce, as well as complete uh, the um, amendments to the uh, Mobile Home Act uh, to allow for us fully to implement our measures to protect renters during this uh, crisis. And um, then the House will rise uh, for uh, Easter week, uh, as was originally scheduled. And um, we may reconvene the legislature on a limited basis uh, in the weeks to come if we need to get further uh, approval for, for, for bills to support the COVID response. So we're meeting on a limited basis dealing um, with, with the COVID crisis uh, in the next, uh, we will, we'll, so I, I suspect that we'll see fewer sittings in the next month as we approach the peak of the pandemic. Um, and we have managed to use sittings this week and last week uh, to get critical legislation passed. Um, I will just put this down, as I said to uh, the opposition leader, uh, once we get past the pandemic and we get back to a relaunch, um, we're gonna bring this legislature back uh, on steroids this summer to do the people's business. Uh, we made commitments to Albertans in the election a year ago, uh, and we're going to keep those commitments. And if that means MLAs rolling up their sleeves and coming here in July and August uh, to pass important legislation that protects Albertans, we're going we're to get the job done. All right, we'll take one more from the phone and wrap up. Uh, operator, can you put through the last caller, please? Our final question comes from Kevin Nimick of CTV. Your line is open. Hi, Premier. You're being sued, or your government, rather, is being sued by the AMA. Uh, they're asking for $250 million in damages. Can I get your response? And, and also, can you afford to lose? Well, uh, first of all, I, I haven't seen this, and uh, I'm not going to comment on uh, things that are going before the courts. That's inappropriate. What I will say is that uh, Alberta has the best compensated physicians in Canada, uh, according to uh, Dr. McKinnon's report and other independent reports, uh, the average gross billings of Alberta physicians is uh, $100,000 more than for their counterparts in Ontario. And, you know, we're fine with that. We believe our, we want to support our physicians. We believe they should not only be paid fairly, but generously. Uh, what we need to do is to uh, prevent th the, uh, that kind of compensation from getting even more out of whack with the rest of the country in the future. Uh, physician compensation in Alberta has grown by nearly 300% in the past 18 years, faster than anybody else's compensation on average, faster than the growth in the economy, faster than inflation, faster certainly than the cost of living. So uh, Alberta physicians enjoy lower taxes and better compensation and benefits than in, in the rest of Canada. And that's great. We just want to make sure that we can manage those costs going into the future, which is why the baseline budget for physician compensation this year remains at $5.4 billion, no reduction. And indeed, the uh, budget for primary care physician compensation remains constant as well. We fully expect, in point of fact, that uh, physician compensation may be going up as a result of our uh, huge uh, additional uh, funding for health care in response to the pandemic. I do recognize that um, uh, perhaps many family physicians are going through challenging times right now uh, because fewer, many fewer people are coming to their clinics. And uh, because of the, the pandemic, it's for the same reason that, that so many other uh, businesses are struggling. Uh, those are professional corporations and their businesses, and, and they, they're facing a huge uh, shortfall in revenue because of the pandemic. That's unfortunate, um, as it is for so many other businesses and business owners. This is the reason uh, why, in part, uh, our government facilitated uh, a special billing code uh, for uh, telephone consultations between patients and uh, primary care physicians. Uh, when uh, they came back to us and said it wasn't enough, we doubled the payment. And um, when they raised concerns about complex modifiers, we put that on hold. Uh, so we've been, I think, very responsive. Uh, our focus is on tackling the pandemic, and I hope that's true uh, for everybody as well. All right. That's a wrap. Thank you.